So what is an elevator pitch and how would you write one? Well, in this very short two minute video, I'm gonna tell you everything you'll ever need to know. Imagine the scene. You're stepping into an elevator with a customer or a consumer or maybe a senior manager within your own business. And your job is to try and explain to them about your fantastic new innovation or product or service before the elevator doors reopen again. Now the key here is you've got to convey the essence of your idea in a way that's highly motivating in a very short period of time. Let's say less than 20 seconds. So it's vital in this situation to be concise and focused on exactly what you need this person to remember. So when writing an elevator pitch, we need to tell them three things. Number one, what problem are we solving? Something we're going to call the insight. What pain point for the consumer or customer? What barrier are we overcoming? What trade-off or compromise are we solving? The second thing we've got to tell them is what benefit we're going to provide. What value will our service or product give to our target customer? And then finally, and most importantly, we've got to explain what makes our idea better than the competition. What makes us unique or superior? If we can clearly communicate just those three things before the elevator doors reopen, then we will have communicated our elevator pitch and they will recall and remember what's vitally important about our idea. This video is part of a series of two minute tutorial videos on marketing subjects, including how to write a value proposition and how to write a consumer insight. Check out the YouTube channel Match Your Innovation to see more like this. Okay, let's start at the very beginning. What is a marketing plan? A marketing plan is a tangible set of goals and steps which show how a company is going to achieve its business plan. So, for example, a company may have a business plan which says it wants to grow over the next five years. But the questions remain, how would that happen? Is that against existing customers or new customers? And what plans and steps will be put in place to make it actually happen? We tend to write marketing plans for the benefit of senior managers to explain what we intend to do and to get a budget in order to do it. And also to align all of the people internally within the company who will be required to contribute to making that happen. OK, so let's look at the five things you need to put in a marketing plan. Number one, you need to have clear marketing goals, objectives and measurements to check that you've achieved those. For example, let's increase value share by selling more of the product that we currently do to existing consumers. And we're going to increase our value share by 20% within a year. Number two, let's talk about who is going to be this target consumer segmentation, personas, trying to identify clearly where these people are and how we're going to reach them. Number three, competitive analysis, a SWOT analysis of who else is out there offering an alternative to us, what's their strengths and weaknesses, and what are we going to do to make ourselves different than them. Number four, tangibly, what marketing mix are we going to use? Are we going to use promotions? Are we going to use trialing devices? Are we going to use advertising? And finally, what are the risks and barriers that might prevent this plan from happening? And what are we going to do to mitigate those risks now that we know those in advance? Let's look at some great examples of advertising. And I'm not going to show you what the brand is. See if you can work it out for yourself. So how did you do? How many of those did you get right? Quite a few, right? So why are they so effective? 
What is it that makes great branded communication? Great brands and propositions are like light from a star. When you see light from a star, it left that star a really long time ago. And so it is with communication and brands. When you see some communication, and when a company just gets about bored of saying the same thing, is around the same time the consumer is just beginning to process that information and understand it and remember it for the first time. Great branded communication is overwhelmingly successful for one reason, and that is repetition. You need to repeat the same message over and over and over again. So there are four simple things to remember when making advertising. Number one, keep it simple. Number two, keep it consistent. Don't chop and change your strategy from one week to the next. Number three, have an effective advertising device, a logo, a jingle, something you can own that you use repeatedly. And finally, number four, be focused. Don't be all over the shop with different messages and different ideas in the same piece of communication. Have one idea, be focused on it, know what you stand for, know what you want to communicate and stick with it. tagline or stratline are those clever words that manufacturers and advertising agencies use at the end of an advert to sum up the whole proposition in the most elegant and memorable way. Let's take a look now at some of the best over the years. Okay, so what's the difference between a superiority statement in a value proposition and a tagline? Well, a superiority statement, otherwise known as a discriminator, sometimes known as a differentiator, or even a unique selling point, needs to be articulated in a clear strategic manner in which people within the organisation can understand it and act upon it. However, when it comes to creating punchy, memorable communication, we translate the superiority statement or unique selling point into a tagline or strap line. This is something that copywriters do to make sure that those words are indelibly imprinted in the consumer or customer's mind. So the strategic direction of a tagline and strap line is identical to the superiority statement, but very often it's shorter, more memorable. So four quick rules to creating your own tagline. Rule number one, use no more than five words. Rule number two, alliteration where possible. Three, keep it simple, short words, punchy words. Finally, make it ownable, perhaps using slang or even a foreign language. Your intention is to make it something that the competition can't copy. So a quick introduction, who was Maslow? Well, he was an American psychologist who in 1943 created a theory called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. But before we get into all of that theory, just have a quick look at this advertising. I have pretty gray hair and I have my pretty wrinkles and I laugh a lot. And I'm hoping my wrinkles will show that I have fun. It's part of growing up, it's a part of maturing and uh, and I enjoy it. I like it. We think beauty comes in all ages, shapes, and sizes. What do you think? Join the debate at CampaignForRealBeauty.com. Wrinkles, gray hair. I think it's pretty. <laughs> Did you like it? 
What did you like about it? Well, it was emotional and it played to our emotions. So what did he say? Well, Maslow pictured a hierarchy of needs in the shape of a pyramid. And at the bottom of this pyramid were physiological needs, functional, rational needs, and then above that emotional needs, and then above that spiritual needs, and then finally something called self-actualization. And Maslow's theory was that human beings like us need to work our way up through this pyramid. What you need to remember is if you talk about the benefit of your product, service or solution and you are overtly rational about it, then you will degrade the value of your proposition. So every time you're communicating your product or writing a value proposition, stop and ask yourself the following. Am I being too rational? Have I expressed the function of my product and translated it into the emotional consequence that my target audience will experience as a result. Segmentation is all around us in marketing and in communication. But what is segmentation? Well, there are four key types. The first type is what we call demographic segmentation. People who are grouped together by a common profile, such as their age or their occupation or their income or their family situation. The second important type of segmentation is what we call psychographic segmentation. And these are people who are grouped together because they share a common belief or a common attitude or a common brand preference. Our third kind of segmentation is a very obvious one called geographic segmentation. People who are grouped together because they live in the same place, maybe North America, maybe Western Europe. Perhaps they live in a city, a metropolitan area or in a rural area. Our fourth and final type of segmentation is what we call usage segmentation. And it's based on the profile of how the consumer or customer interacts with products today. Are they heavy users? Are they light users? When do they buy? How do they buy? On what occasions do they use? Are they loyal consumers or are they promiscuous consumers? Have they heard of you? Are they aware of you? Are they unaware of you? Now, why do we need to do segmentation at all? Well, simply put, we're trying to narrow down a large target audience to a common group of people, smaller, more easy to reach, more easy to identify, who share these common attributes. And most sophisticated marketing companies won't just pick one of these separately. They'll blend them together to create the profile of the perfect target audience. Let's have a quick look for a moment at some fantastic advertising for products that have made a clear distinction about who their target is and who their target isn't. I want you to think about targeting like a spectrum. At one end of this line is everybody in the whole wide world. And at the other end of this line is one person. Now, when it comes to marketing, the absolute best target would be one person. Because if we have one target, we can understand who they are and what they want and what they believe and what are the products that they buy and what their income is and what their job is and what their family situation is. And so we can make the perfect solution and communicate in a relevant way straight to them. Now at the other end of this spectrum is everybody in the whole wide world. Now if you ask me what does everybody in the whole wide world need, well the answer is everything. 
I can't make clear choices about what features to put in my product. I can't make clear choices about what language to use when I'm talking to them. I have to make vague commitments and I have to use this woolly, fluffy language which doesn't really speak to anybody. And the people who look at my product or look at my solution don't see themselves in my communication or in the choices that I've made and they go off and they buy from somebody who is clearly offering exactly what they need. Remember this, one of the biggest mistakes in marketing is to believe that you can be all things to all people. Marketing is about making choices, not only about who you want to target, but who you will not target. Having great insights is vital to growing your business. Perhaps you want to launch a new piece of innovation and you want to understand consumer insights to build a better product. Perhaps you want to create great marketing and communication of why your product solves your customer's problem better than any of the competition. But when people ask me, well, how do I know if I have a good insight? I always teach them about the three W's. W number one, do you understand what the customer is currently doing? Do you have data or an observation about how they are behaving or what problem they have? Or do you understand the dilemma that they're facing, a barrier, a trade-off, a compromise they're being required to make? We need W number one, what, an observation, as the building block of the rest of our insight. Then the second W in our three W's is why. Do you understand why they are behaving in the way they are? Why they need to do the thing they, they are doing? Why they have the problem that they currently have? Do you understand the motivation behind that observation? Because the better you understand why they are behaving in the way they are, the more you can solve that problem appropriately. And then number three in our list of three W's is wow. When you look at your insight, is there something new there? Is there something fresh? When a customer or a consumer hears an insight, their innate reaction should be, wow, you really understand me. That's exactly what I'm thinking. That's exactly what I'm doing. That's exactly why I'm doing it. Now, hey, how, how do you know that? You must really get me. You must really care about me. So there should be a wow in your insight where you are saying something that no one has ever said before or a level of detail that no one has ever gone into before. If you look at your own communication or your own advertising or the competitor advertising and you see this insight there, then it's generic and someone's already said it before or people are already saying it. And that is a weak insight. So. This little video is gonna help you create the formula for good insights. It's part of a series about consumer insights and customer insights in B2B, B2C, and B2B2C. So if you want to learn more about it, subscribe to my channel and check out the other videos. So how do insights work in business to business? Well, in this very short two minute video tutorial, I'm going to explain everything you need to know. So unlike business to consumer, where the end user is the consumer, and that's the only person we need to really concern ourselves with, in business to business, we have a whole series of stakeholders in what we're going to call the stakeholder chain. So how do we create insights when we have a diversity of opinions like that? Well, the first thing we need to do is identify what we're going to call the key stakeholder. This is the person in the chain with the most to gain or the most to lose from our solution. Imagine the stakeholder chain like an earthquake and the earthquake is going off at the key stakeholder. They're at the epicenter. They feel the pain of the problem most acutely. 
they are the person who loses sleep about it at night. Conversely, they're the person who will become our biggest advocate within the organization if we can solve the problem because we're solving their biggest issue. Next, we need to look beyond the key stakeholder up and down the rest of the chain and identify how solving that same problem will create value for all the other stakeholders. Now, the big mistake to avoid is we're not looking for a different problem for every other stakeholder. We're looking at how the same problem being solved could create value for everyone. That's what we call the red thread. The idea that solving the key stakeholders need creates knock on value for everybody else in the chain. This video is part of a series of two minute tutorial videos on lots of marketing subjects. You can subscribe to see more of them at Matt Shaw Innovation at YouTube, or you can visit my website, mattshaw.com. When people say to me, what is it that you actually do? I say, well, all I do is I go to companies, big, big technology companies, maybe companies that have been around for hundreds of years. And I say, do you know what? You might want to consider asking people what they need before you give them something. And then the people I'm talking to say, really? You have to actually say that, do you? I say, yes, I have to say it. And I've said it maybe 40,000 times. And I keep on having to say it because it's not that obvious. And actually, it's more sophisticated even than that, because the question that you ask will determine the kind of innovation that you create. And it reminds me of an analogy that was created in the 1940s that remains just as true today as it did then. And the analogy says this, no one ever needed a drill. Never, ever, ever in human history has anyone needed a drill. What they needed was a hole. And if we don't understand the difference between the drill and the hole, we'll create a completely different form of innovation that's not insight driven. Let's think about it like this. If I ask the customer about the drill, I'll say something like this. You know the drill that I already make. Well, how could it be improved? It seems like a kind of legitimate kind of way to generate insights. But it'll lead to this kind of response. Well, I don't know, says the customer. Maybe you could make the drill slightly longer. Maybe make it slightly shorter. Maybe make it slightly wider, slightly thinner. Maybe make it go through bricks as well as through wood. I don't know. Put it in a box with all different shapes and sizes of drills in the same box to give me choice. Put a little hole at the top of the box so I can hang it on a hook on the side of my ladder. So when I'm up the ladder and I'm already in the process of drilling, I don't need to climb down in order to change the drill. Well, it seems like I'm doing insight generation, but I can assure you the only thing I will do as a result of that process is create a new drill. Imagine for a second I don't ask about the technology, but I ask about the desired outcome. Why did you need a hole in the first place? Well, the response I'll get from the customer will be very different. Oh, says the customer. Oh, well, I've just bought a new house and I've plastered and painted the walls and now I want to hang a picture up. And now I know that as an innovator, I can say, well, hang on a minute then. The last thing you need is a drill because a drill is going to put a dirty, great hole through your new paint and plaster. And once you've hung your picture up, you'll never be able to move it because it's disguising that hole. What you actually need, now I understand what you're doing, is you need something that's going to be able to hang a picture up and be strong enough, but that can be moved at any time without leaving any damage or residue. You can see that asking about the desired outcome is far more likely to lead to breakthrough innovation. So why don't people do that? It seems so obvious. Why don't people ask questions about the hole and not the drill? Well, in my experience, it's because they have a factory somewhere that makes drills. Actually, they don't want to hear that the answer isn't a drill. They've got the world's best R&D expertise in drill manufacture or in drill design. They've got a whole vested interest in making sure the answer is a drill. It's not that they don't know how to ask different questions. It's that they're scared of asking a different question in case they get the answer that what they intend to do is not the correct thing. But of course, it's false economy not to ask that question because a competitor that isn't constrained in that way will hear the same answer. And when they bring that to market and disrupt the market and it is the correct and more appropriate solution, the company will lose. 
And then someone will say to you, you know, why didn't we see that coming? Why didn't we understand that? And the truth will be because either we did hear it and we chose to ignore it, or we didn't hear it because we purposely framed the question in a way that demanded our technology. And when I think about examples of that, Polaroid are the perfect example. They made cameras that spit out little bits of paper and they made that for years. And they didn't want to hear that that wasn't the correct answer. So when they said to the customer, you know that camera that we make, how could we improve it? Well, the customer will give you an answer, but it's constrained to the current technology. Well, I don't know, they say. Maybe make the little bits of paper that come out slightly bigger. Maybe make the camera slightly smaller. Maybe make it develop slightly faster. Truth is, I don't really want one of those at all, but you're not asking me what I really want. If you'd have said, what are you trying to achieve? You'd have got a very different response. Hey, well, I want to go to a building site in Hong Kong. I want to take a picture of the building site and send it back to my client in New York because I'm an architect and I want my client to comment on the building before I leave Hong Kong. I want to go to a party, take a picture of my friends. Someone will be sneezing, somebody will be laughing, someone will be looking in the wrong direction. So I want to take as many pictures as I like, be able to review them and see that I've got the one I want before everyone disperses and then dispose of all the pictures I don't want at no cost. If Polaroid had asked that question, they would definitely have developed the digital camera. And they, I can't think of an organisation or brand that should have developed the digital camera more than Polaroid. And the reason that they didn't was because when they thought of insight generation, they were focused on the drill and not the hole. A written value proposition or concept that succinctly summarises the value of my idea on paper so I can test it with customers, see how attractive it is before we go to the more time consuming and expensive process of prototyping something, designing something and developing something. And the answer is there is a standard template which is used throughout multiple industries for creating such a written concept on paper and it always consists of the same core elements. The first one of those is a definition of the target. By segmenting the target into more specific focused people based on their attitudes or based on their beliefs or based on their behaviour or based on their location, gender, age, we can start to narrow down who it is we're talking about. And that's the essential first step of creating a value proposition. And if we're in business to business, there may be multiple people in that value chain that we need to consider. The next part of any good concept or value proposition is a definition of what problem we intend to solve, which we are going to call the insight. And the insight relates directly to the target. It will be the target's biggest unmet need. And they will have many, many problems and unmet, unmet needs, but we are focused on the one that is most significant to them because in solving that, that escalates the value of our proposition. Now the next thing, our third element, is to understand what alternatives already exist in the market for the customer to resolve that problem. Who directly or indirectly already delivers against that problem? And why they fail to adequately solve it? Because of course, if the alternatives are solving the problem perfectly well already, then the size of the opportunity is limited for us. The fourth aspect of our value proposition will then be our promise, what we call the benefit. And we don't really get to control the benefit. The benefit is a function of the insight. If the customer says to us, do you know what my biggest problem is? This is my biggest problem. Then the benefit we offer can't be anything else. It has to be a commitment to solve that problem, nothing else. We can't have multiple benefits. We only have to have one benefit to solve the big unmet need of the customer, the insight. But of course, the customer will then say, well, hang on a minute. I don't believe that you can promise that. I don't believe you can deliver that. I don't believe you can make my biggest problem go away. Give me a reason to believe that you can. So the fifth element of a good value proposition is what we call the reason to believe. The proof that we can make the benefit come to life and deliver the promise to solve the insight, despite the fact all those alternatives 
have failed to do so in the past. And then ultimately, most good value propositions end on a point of superiority. Some people call it a discriminator, a differentiator, a USP, a, a unique selling point. Ultimately, what we want to be able to say is, in this value proposition that we're offering you, we can deliver the benefit to a high degree of uniqueness and superiority over everything else that exists in the market, hence you should come to us. Now, I haven't created anything unique here. This is something that exists inside the biggest marketing organisations. They may call it something different. At Unilever, they call it the brand key. At uh, Philips, they call it the value proposition house. Uh, it doesn't really matter what you call it. They all contain those six core elements. And when they're presented to the customer in the form of a written concept, they make the story believable and compelling and over many many years that format has been proven to test well. The single biggest mistake that people make when creating insights is they mistake observations for insights. Observations are the building blocks of insights but they are ultimately just facts. People enjoy the preparation of food more than the eating sometimes is not an insight, it's an observation. Unless we know why, we can't move on to creating a useful value proposition. I went to see a customer once who told me they had an insight that people buy less wallpaper paste during a recession. And when I asked them why that was, they said, probably because they have less money. Well, maybe, or maybe because they're buying and selling less houses and people tend to decorate their houses in order to maximise the value before a sale or decorate their houses after a sale in order to personalise the house to their own tastes. Maybe painters come into fashion during the recession and wallpaper is seen as just too expensive. Uh, ultimately, someone may have created wallpaper with a self-adhesive backing and now you don't need wallpaper paste at all. The truth is, the first piece of information was just an observation and we need to do a process to synthesize the observation into insight by adding the motivation and desired outcome that hides behind that piece of data. And how do we do that? Well what we do is we do an insight synthesis workshop. We collect together those observations there's nothing wrong with them as the start point. In fact, they're incredibly valuable. And we can draw that information from all sorts of sources, from quantitative studies, from trends presentation, from forecasts, from share data, from any kind of useful source of information about the customer and the market and our products. But then we need to turn them into insights by adding the motivation and the desired outcome that the customer has. And we can only do that initially by creating some hypothesis. So we call these first draft insights hypothesis insights because until we've tested and validated them with the customer, they're not real validated insights. But they do create good stimulus for our conversation with the customer. What is an accepted customer belief? Well, an accepted customer belief, or an ACB, is something that the customer believes to be true because the industry has taught them that over the years. It's neither an insight nor an observation. It's an ingrained belief which affects the customer's purchasing uh, decision and their behaviour. Now, a good example of an accepted customer belief is the more blades on a razor, the more effectively it shaves. So, manufacturers have taught them that two blades is good, three blades is better, four blades, five blades, infinite number of blades added to a razor is always going to make the shave better. Now, if you ask customers, they'll say, what I need is more blades on a razor. Looking for a close shave? Then you're looking for the new Quintipio Mega Shave. Now with 15 extra large blades. Same thing with hair dryers. A few years ago, average hair dryer was about one and a half thousand watts. 10 years later, the average hairdryer, 2,500 watts. Now, you can't hold a 2,500 watt hairdryer far enough away from your head not to burn your hair and burn your scalp. 
So manufacturers have to put ceramic and ionic diffusion technologies in hair dryers to prevent you from burning your hair. But that unnecessarily powerful motor, which is making the hair dryer unnecessarily hot, is making the hair dryer heavy and making your arm ache when you hold it in the morning. Now the key thing about accepted customer beliefs is they go past a point of maximum utility where the product n no longer makes sense and no longer delivers its core function, but the consumer or the customer continues to ask for it even when the manufacturer decides this is no longer a game it wants to play. So beginning accepted customer beliefs sounds like a good idea from the manufacturer's point of view, but long term, it's a trap you really want to avoid.